Okay, I just snuck in. Locked. I'm deep underground in Disney's top secret labs, where they make everything. Nice. Whoa. Wait until everybody sees this. Okay, now what happens if I do this? Hello. What would you like to know? Whoa. What's the deal with Kingdom Hearts? Kingdom Hearts was born from a coincidence. In the late 1990s, Squaresoft and Walt Disney Japan shared the same office building in Meguro, Tokyo, and so interaction between members of both companies was probably pretty common. For this story at least, Shinji Hashimoto and an executive from Disney met in an elevator and discussed the possibility of collaborating. The idea was actually there long before the collaboration proposals to Disney. The series director and longtime Square Guides Hetsuya Nomura was inspired by Super Mario 64 to make a similar game with open, explorable spaces in 3D, but shot down by his colleagues who suggested it would be impossible without a popular Mario-esque mascot as well known as Disney's very own characters. Years after this initial inspiration from Mario 64, Nomura willingly joined as part of this new Disney Square collaboration, after having overheard Hashimoto's own Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi discussing Mickey Mouse. It's often said that it started after we happened to meet while in the same building, but the story of making a game with Disney actually goes back further than that. So, one day I was, for some reason, in the same room as Hashimoto-san and Sakaguchi-san, all three of you just happened to be there at the same time? That's right. I had been called there for some completely different reason, but when I arrived, Tashimoto san and Sakaguchi san were talking about a discussion they'd had with Disney. Having an exchange along the lines of Mickey Mouse would have been great, but we can't use him. At that moment, I basically put my hand up and said, I want to be a part of this. That's how it all began. But at that point, I wasn't really thinking of making a game that featured Mickey Mouse. Anyway, in the end they both came to the conclusion that they would let Tetsu give it a try. But why did you put your hand up in the first place? What interested you? Well, just as I was working on Final Fantasy VII, Mario 64 was released. The fully three-dimensional spaces and the freedom you had to run around them had a big impact on me. When I told my colleagues I wanted to make a game like that, they said, but Mario's already a world-famous character. It would be impossible to start from scratch with an all-new character. They didn't think you could compete with Mario? Exactly. Somebody even said the only way you could do it is with characters that are as well known as Disney's. That really stuck in my head, so, when I heard we could be working with Disney characters, I naturally jumped at the chance. So, you put your hand up for this project because of the impact Mario 64 had on you, and because your colleague had mentioned that it would be impossible to create a game like that unless you use Disney characters. You remember those words, and the rest is history. Nomura didn't want to make a game starring Mickey Mouse though. That was lame and uncool. So when meeting with Disney about the game concept, he threw out any ideas they had proposed. Nomura's vision was influenced by Mario, and Disney's immersive real-life theme parks. It's never suggested in any material I found, but I'd like to think this was thought up when developing Final Fantasy VII with its Disney-esque gold saucer theme park location. What if Cloud went to Disneyland? Nomura wanted to make a game about original characters going on an adventure across multiple different Disney worlds. In a subsequent meeting, he showed off his idea for a main character. Disney wasn't so happy with the initial design, and so changes were made to better suit both sides of vision of the game. The game started development by 2000. For the longest time, however, Kingdom Hearts wasn't even legitimately approved. No higher-ups in Japan could approve it, and when Disney Interactive VP Shuji Utsumi discovered this, he took it upon himself to actually get it approved. Turns out I sir. was in town with his hundred or so management members, so what better time than any for Utsumi to ask for official authorization? He brought the topic of Kingdom Hearts up, and I sir. was like, yeah, go ahead, keep at it, champ. Despite the experimental project conflicting with any expectations of approval, it was given a steady thumbs up. And when I say experimental, I mean this is the first title where Disney franchises could combine, and was such a new concept that Mickey Goddamn Mouse didn't even have a 3D style guide. 
3D animation was well established by this time, but Mickey's first 3D appearance in animation was years later in a Christmas movie. His first 3D appearance in a game was Mickey's Speedway USA, an N64 game released literally later that same year. So, yeah, Kingdom Hearts was pretty goddamn unlikely. The fact that it even exists and I'm currently talking about it is like a cosmic phenomenon, Squaresoft got so lucky here. And not only was it a first for Disney, but for Square as well. The game side of things, the gameplay of the game, involved something fully new for anyone working at Square. Action. <laughs> not to say games prior to this didn't have action, but 1998's Urgeist or 2000's THE BOUNCER were fighting oriented, and when it came to full RPGs, the only real experience the company had was with the 2D Mana series and Brave Fence and Musashi, a PS1 game developed by a different team altogether. Squaresoft was experienced in turn-based strategy and not fast-paced action. Nomura had a concept ready for something like Kingdom Hearts, but he states there was hardly anyone who had action design experience. Now, at this point Square had been making role-playing games for a long time. Were there many people in your organization who had experience of making a game as action-oriented as this? No, there was hardly anyone. But with a drive to keep going, and with approval from Eisner, Kingdom Hearts eventually finished production. In May of 2000, it was announced at PlayStation Festival that Square would be collaborating with Disney Interactive on a new game project, really hyping it up and making it sound like the best damn thing ever. I think around this time it was still in its earlier stages of development, however. Later in 2001, Kingdom Hearts was fully revealed to the public at E3. Nobody had ever seen anything like it, genuinely. This was unlike anything else going on at the time. I mean, it's goddamn Squaresoft and Disney collaborating. Do I look like I didn't notice how silly this all is? The game industry was absolutely swimming in it though, the line of Fury 2001 was genuinely insane. They had this, Final Fantasy X, Devil May Cry, Silent Hill 2, Melia Solid 2, Animal Crossing, Metroid Prime, Smash Bros. Melee, Grand Theft Auto, Goddamn 3, and don't even get me started on SpongeBob SquarePants Super Sponge. And like, dude, The Rock was there. Fucking Dwayne The Rock Johnson was in the same building as Kingdom Hearts' E3 debut. Coverage on this game's presence at E3 that year is impossible to find though. Apart from this old IGN article covering that the game was in fact there, I couldn't find any old video coverage or conference announcements that Kingdom Hearts was the next Square game. Instead, the focus was all on Final Fantasy at Sony's conference. Kingdom Hearts' most major presence at the show that I can find came in the form of a single trailer and a press kit including limited information on the game and a media disc containing screenshots alongside Square's other major releases of that period, which included Final Fantasy X, Final Fantasy IV on Chrono Trigger for PlayStation, and Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. <coughs> Kingdom Hearts' promotion was certainly present, but it wasn't held with high regard like Final Fantasy X or other upcoming PlayStation exclusives. It was one of many, rather than THE game that got people talking, and that's likely due to how unusual it is to begin with. Critics and reporters stated how unusual the collaboration was, but had confidence that the game would at least be fun because it was a Square joint, somewhat reflecting how the dev team themselves had felt about making something so new. Well, you were a first time director, assembling your staff, trying to persuade Disney to accept your ideas, working in an unfamiliar genre. Those extra hurdles probably made this project three or four times harder than usual. I think you're right. Ha ha. There were several moments during development when the staff would panic and become anxious, not knowing whether the game we were making was going to be fun or not. If you've been involved with a game from its very inception, it often becomes hard to tell whether it's actually fun or not, doesn't it? That's right. I did keep telling them not to worry, that it would definitely be fun. 2002 came around, and as journalists pondered, advertisement for the game through TV ads, VHS promos, demo discs, and even a Flash website was launched. The game was set for a March 2002 release in Japan, with later September and November releases following for international regions. Despite Nomura's apparent longing for the game to reach a varied audience for many ages, Kingdom Hearts probably struck younger audiences far easier than older ones, being advertised alongside costumes and sitcoms on Disney Channel in 2002. The only grown-ups I could imagine being excited about this game would have been Final Fantasy enthusiasts curious about its new action combat, or those wackos who go to Disneyland every couple months. But I think it did good in having something for a variety of players over just being for kids. Keep in mind, this is during a time when the video game market was split between kids games and mature games. 
When the Wind Waker is revealed around the same time, adults who want something mature are upset to see something cartoonish. So in many ways, Kingdom Hearts is ahead of its time for trying its best to appeal to both crowds. None of the promotional material feels like it's explicitly telling kids to check it out, but rather it maintains the sort of coolness of Square's other games. It doesn't feel like Disney had any involvement, despite being all about their legacy. All the pre-release interviews that I could find focus on the developers, and even the Disney Channel commercial for kids suggests that the game was created in a futuristic lab and unambiguously has Nomura show up as the game designer. How is it made? Accessing interview with game designer. What's he saying? There's a Venn diagram of audience appeal here, and they certainly did their best to handle that. Its odd combination of ideas let it appeal to a massive crowd of PS2 owners. The console itself had already sold 30 million units in just its first two years. Casual, movie-loving audiences who got a PS2 to play DVDs may have seen Kingdom Hearts and found it appealing on behalf of its immersive worlds based around Disney. Serious, game-loving audiences who got a PS2 to play its high-end RPGs may have seen Kingdom Hearts and found it appealing on behalf of its fresh action gameplay and Final Fantasy roots. And kids who got a PS2 because it's in the living room hooked up to the TV may have seen Kingdom Hearts and found it appealing on behalf of its colorful visuals and cool theming. It's a win for Disney and Square overall, and this mass appeal is most likely why it was agreed upon by both parties to begin with. It wasn't even the first time Square tried something more family friendly, with many examples like Super Mario RPG and Chocobo Racing aiming for that younger demographic. Disney, on the other hand, didn't need to try to break into the mature side of the audience. Their most well-known movies are loved by all ages, and some even contain pretty heavy themes themselves that allow adults to find more in them than kids would. And in the end, this crazy idea ended up working. Between its Japanese launch in March 2002 and at the end of the year, it sold a total of over 3 million copies worldwide, immediately joining the greatest hits lineup for PS2. As of now, it stands as the PS2's 10th best-selling game of all time. Nearly 6 million copies, that's roughly 4% of every PS2 owner worldwide. And that's a lot. So Kingdom Hearts was a smash hit, to say the least. Its new ideas and unprecedented combination of them resulted in something many adored. And so it led to many sequels, spin-offs, a manga series, a weird lost Disney cartoon pilot, a long storyline that famously confuses everyone, a remaster for PS3 and PS4 and PC and Xbox and arguably Switch, and in 2021 Sora was announced for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate as its most requested final character. It's one of the big boys, despite its unlikely inception, and that's pretty impressive. And yeah, I wasn't there for this at all. I was born a good couple of years after Kingdom Hearts released, and by the time I was old enough to understand what a video game was, the games I did play were definitely not Squaresoft RPGs. My earliest memories are of Mario Kart, PC games, Little Big Planet, Wii games, Grand Theft Auto, and its weird LCD SpongeBob McDonald's toy that I only just remembered existed. Both. I don't even know if something like Kingdom Hearts would have appealed to me at an early age. I vividly remember being kinda of bored of classic Disney movies if they were playing on TV or shown in school, but as time went on I gained appreciation for classics like Alice in Wonderland, Beauty and the Beast, and The Little Mermaid, the stuff we had on DVD. My taste was more in contemporary stuff. Toy Story, Shrek, Cars, Monsters Inc., The Incredibles, Robots, it's just more of what we had at home over Disney. My absolute favourite movie was the Spongebob movie though. I watched Spongebob on TV all the time, and I was definitely more of a Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network kid than a Disney Channel. Kid. Not that Disney wasn't unavoidable though, I still saw hits like Tangled, The Princess and the Frog, Bolt, Racket Ralph as they released. My sister got really into that Tim Burton remake of Alice in Wonderland and played Little Big Planet levels based on the original movie with me. My teacher in primary school had old Disney tapes lined up on a shelf, it's just that other animation was catching my attention far more in the late 2000s and early 2010s, and old tiny fantasy was never my go-to. Later on, when Netflix was new and actually had Disney movies on it, I checked out more we never had on DVD, like Aladdin or Hercules or The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which was the best one by far, by the way, and developed a better understanding of these films and why they're so beloved. Not too long after, Disney bought out like eight different production studios, started their own Netflix alternative, and took over the world.
But their older animation is still pretty cozy. I just wouldn't ever buy a subscription for Disney+. Plus. What this means in regards to Kingdom Hearts, though, is that unlike Tessia Nomura, or any of the team working on the game at Squaresoft, I'm not a diehard Disney fan. I still haven't really seen most of their widely known films, animated or not. Regardless of how I feel now, I was never really a Disney kid and Kingdom Hearts wouldn't have got me hooked on the premise of being like all those big movies when I was old enough to play something like it. Also, my family didn't even have a PS2 while I was growing up. I may have been there for the first few years of my life, but the instant the Wii and PS3 came out in the late 2000s, they immediately got those in its place. The hypothetical scenario where my parents got Kingdom Hearts as a game for me to play on the family PlayStation just wouldn't have happened anyway. I was born too late for that. So if you're wondering if I grew up with this game, uh... No. When it comes to JRPGs, the other side of Kingdom Hearts' main appeal, I definitely didn't know any growing up. Call me Scott that was, because I was not an RPG kid. My initial exposure to games growing up was through anything but role-playing. My sister had a DS with Zelda on it, which I played for a couple minutes one time as a five-year-old, and that was the closest thing. Not even Pokemon had me interested. My first JRPGs were on the 3DS way later, when I played stuff like Xenoblade Chronicles 3D and Fantasy Life. I definitely knew about RPGs by then, but never actively played them. I didn't even make much progress in those aforementioned 3DS RPGs. The first JRPG I truly got into was Earthbound, a relevant game after the release of Undertale and how much comparison was being made between the two. When I was introduced to both games, I didn't actually play either of them. Instead, I watched a stream series by Vinesel's Joel for both. Gigas. Gigas. Guga. And I tried my best to play, but never got far in or found on my Wii U. Earthbound did end up being in my top favorite games of all time, but not exclusively for its gameplay. I also tried some Pokemon over time, and got pretty heavily into Yokai Watch, but never much else. It's really pretty tragic to think about that I've struggled and tried to get into JRPGs for so long, knowing their potential and how good they can be but just never having played many of them. The first Squaresoft RPG I ever played and beat was Final Fantasy VII in 2020. I've tried others, like Final Fantasy IX and Dragon Quest VIII, but rarely do I get as into them as I do with action games or platformers. The turn-based encounters never particularly matched with me. I didn't even beat Final Fantasy VII, I used cheats for a lot of that playthrough. Kingdom Hearts isn't turn-based, but it's still by Square. If I had to be a fan of Final Fantasy to get maximum enjoyment from its content, then Kingdom Hearts probably wasn't for me. One thing's for sure, if I did play it, I would be trying something new. The presence of Kingdom Hearts in my life was never particularly remarkable to begin with. I knew of it, the main discussion around it being that Kingdom Hearts 3 was taking forever and would probably never happen or that the series' story was ridiculous and incomprehensible. When Kingdom Hearts 3 finally did launch, I had no reason to be excited other than seeing this long-awaited new entry in a famous series finally be real and for people to finally shut up about it. The series has always been shrouded in mystery, and I never understood its existence or its die-hard fans, and I even disliked it for a while. I don't really know why I disliked it though, I think it was just because of Disney being Disney. When Sora was announced for Smash, I didn't really care, but I thought it was nice for the majority of fans who wanted him in the game. <laughs> Also pretty surreal as a crossover game joining a crossover game. Around the same time as the Smash announcement, Vine Source Joel started streaming Kingdom Hearts. He didn't get far in the game, but I watched those streams and genuinely adored the game's cozy feeling while some funny guy was talking over it. How about this? And leave! Ooh. Oh, the Helvete control, helvet, what the fuck? There was also a cloud streaming version demo on the Switch, which I played all three minutes of and thought it was... Oh, well, I mean, it's a cloud streaming version. In fact, I kind of wanted to play the game around this time, but the Switch version was on the cloud, I didn't have a PS4 or Xbox, and the PC version is Epic Game Store exclusive for some reason. I considered playing the original PS2 version, but I never got around to it and as time passed, I lost interest. It remained in the back of my mind though, somewhere. About a year passed, and suddenly it was added to PlayStation Plus alongside every other Kingdom Hearts game. 
This month I could play it at no extra cost. Whoa, this video is not sponsored by Sony. <laughs> by this point my interest in trying JRPGs was reignited as well. Hot off the heels of binging a bunch of action button and actively participating in its Discord server. A server so full of square fans that there's a dedicated Kingdom Hearts enjoyer role. I told some people in there I'd be playing the game for the first time and taking notes throughout, and they all expressed positive opinions about the game. I was ready. It was going to be an experiment though, the game is so famously unusual and my experience with it was near blind, so I wanted to take notes and record my playthrough from the beginning to the end. I wanted people to know, in some form, what it's like to go into the series totally blind. I could have streamed it, but I don't like streaming RPGs and had different plans anyway. The following my blind thoughts on the game are through each area, most of my initial reactions to parts of the game, and overall what I think of Kingdom Hearts 1.5 Remix HD, HD Remix Final Mix, Deluxe Remix HD for the PlayStation 4. <laughs> The title screen for this game is really pretty, in a minimalistic sort of way. Its music, dearly beloved, is beautiful, starting off the soundtrack and overall game with style. It's melancholic. I didn't know what it represented yet, but I was sure I'd understand it in due time. My first choice came up. Which difficulty do I go with? I picked the medium final mix difficulty, as medium difficulties tend to be the most balanced and intended to play by the developers. But I was already confused. Final Mix Beginner Easy was for beginners, but Final Mix Medium was good for first timers. Did they just not make up their mind on which difficulty was actually best for beginners? I decided it didn't matter, and continued on with what I believed would be a balanced experience with the Final Mix mode. The, the, you know, the, the one that's good for first time, not, not the beginner mode that's easy, but the, the, the good for first Then the intro movie hit me like a truck. It's slow. Sora says, I've been having these weird thoughts lately. Like, is any of this for real? Or not? And then the music grabbed me by the shirt and rattled me around with how exquisitely 2002 it felt. I don't even know if it, like, fits, like, the tone of the game, but man did it leave an impression. My first note when seeing this was literally this opening movie fucks. Past the CG opening, I began with the first of this game's introduction sequence. This big stained glass void zone that I was pretty sure was like a dream or a metaphorical representation of Sora's mind, or just something they put in because it looks cool. I learned the controls. And importantly, I made the choice of picking the mystic trait and dropping the shield trait. I hoped this didn't affect me negatively. Continuing on, some cutesy Final Fantasy characters asked me some deep questions. At first I thought they were all from Final Fantasy X, but apparently Selfie is from Final Fantasy VIII, which like I didn't know while I was playing the game, and like I, I had to like I, I found that out while I was researching for the video, like I, I, I literally did not know that because I've never played Final Fantasy VIII or X. I don't know how or if these questions affected gameplay at all, so I just went with my honest answers. I want friendship. I want to see rare sights. I'm afraid of being indecisive. This intro is pretty dramatic, right? After these big choices, I bashed a guy's arms and Sora woke up. I noticed during that fight how jangly Sora's walking noise is, to account for the copious amounts of chains on his outfit, which is a nice detail. Also, these cutscenes are uncanny. Something about the mouth animation is mildly unsettling, and the dialogue is a little awkward. Yes, sure. Say, Kyrie, what was your hometown like? You know, where you grew up? I've told you before, I don't remember. Nothing at all? Nothing. You ever wanna go back? Uh, alright, now the game is starting, I think. The title showed up, as well as the location, Destiny Islands. I don't know why these kids are stranded on an island, 
or why some of them are from Final Fantasy games, but okay. So this is actually the tutorial part of the game, even though the part before was also a tutorial, like, uh, this is like part two of the tutorial I guess. It drops me in a level I'm able to explore and practice combat in, which is neat, it's very relaxed. Oh yeah, also there's an objective here. I need us to find items to progress, but the game doesn't make it clear when something's an item and when it's just part of the scenery. For example, the cloth on the wall just looks like it's a part of that room and not a pick upable item. I gather it's all part of teaching the player, but I just felt lost more than anything looking for this stuff. I found it though. At the end of the day, the friends all hang out and talk about fruit or something. Also, Riku's fruity for Sora, right? That's that's like that's what's happening here, right? The thing with the fruit, like fruity, like am, am, I, am I reading too much into this? If there are any other worlds out there, why did we end up on this one? And suppose there are other worlds, then ours is just a little piece of something much greater. So. We could have just as easily ended up somewhere else, right? I don't know. I don't know why these kids are trying to get to other worlds. Is it like a euphemism for something? In fact, what's even going on here? Does it matter? Donald Duck shows up. I almost forgot this was a Disney game. The whiplash is so strong when you go from anime kids having an existential crisis to Donald and Goofy just hanging out in a castle. Mickey Mouse went missing apparently and- Oh, okay, the next day. There's more stuff to collect. This is where the game kind of started to annoy me. Collecting all these items is fine in concept, but when it's across such a relatively large space and each item blends into the scenery, it gets way too difficult to read for a literal tutorial. Like, I'm not even kidding, I was so lost here that I needed to look up a guide. For a tutorial stage, that's probably a bad sign. Later I went and mentioned this to some folks in the Action Button Goblin Dunker, the server that I mentioned before. This is what they had to say. I don't remember the coconuts, but the first few areas of that game are especially rough. Don't worry, once you've learned how to get coconuts, you'll never be asked to use an equivalent skill ever again. Kingdom Hearts 1 is one of those games I like, but has that one part I dread. Whenever I think of replaying it, except that one part is the entire game. I think the gamma play in Kingdom Hearts 1 is great as far as combat and platforming are concerned. The problem is its level and area design. Finding resources on Destiny Isles is like the single sneeze that heralds the coming flu. A big part of Kingdom Hearts 1 was the novelty, and not just in the Disney slash FF crossover bit, there was nothing that played like it before. Even now, it still has this sort of uncanny quality to its combat and level design that's hard to find. This might have spoiled my views for the game going in, but I thought it would be worth bringing up here. To realize that bashing the trees to collect coconuts is a completely worthless skill for the rest of the game, and that common opinions of the game were that its level design is bad. The single sneeze that heralds the coming flu. I mean, it wouldn't be so bad, right? This game's still renowned by many. Well, you know, at least I think so. I want us to continue playing anyway, despite this already messy design. The second day is over and- no, wait, Sora's parents- wait, Sora lives in a house? Wait, I thought these kids were on an island, why are their parents- I, I, I guess the wall is standing or something? I, I also couldn't get used to the combat yet, I, I, I thought the lock-on system felt weird and the number of heartless fellows attacking me at once was a bit overwhelming. I, I fought Big Shadow Boss Man again though, I woke up in Travis Town and met Sid from Final Fantasy VII. That's a character I recognize, whoa. Overall, this is a pretty confusing game so far. Oh, Donald, uh, you know, I bet you that, uh... Ah, what do you know, you big boy cat? This is the part of the game where anime boy Sora and Disney fellows Donald and Goofy converge. Donald and Goofy are looking for some guy named Leon, and I don't know who- It's the guy from Final Fantasy VIII. Why'd he change his name? <laughs> also, finding him was kind of a mess, I had to just kind of randomly go through doors to activate scenes until Leon showed up. I died against him because I couldn't handle these battle controls, and that's fine because it's descriptive to Yuffie and Aerith are here. I, I, I don't know why, but this was even more surreal than anything that happened before, because Aerith is like a main, main character in Final Fantasy VII, and here she is talking to Donald Duck. I, I, I cannot believe that this game is real. Listen, I live in a world where Super Smash Bros. Ultimate and its 80 character roster exists. 
a world where a whole franchise of superhero movies were meticulously set up to converge into one storyline. A world where Microsoft, Nintendo, and Amazon agreed to bring GoldenEye N64 to the Switch and Xbox One. A world where iCarly and Victorious had a movie-length episode in which every character throws a massive party, and also the guy from Good Burger shows up. A world where LeBron James and Goku can shoot Mr. Beast in the head to win a victory royale and then dance to Gangnam Style. For better or worse, I am living in the age of crossover media, and yet the image of Donald fucking Duck looking at Aerith Gainsborough from Final Fantasy VII in an officially licensed game that released over two decades ago does not feel real to me. But you know, it's pretty funny. <laughs> This is where I really got to practice combat with the many enemy encounters along my way up to when Donald and Goofy finally joined my party. Here is when I noticed that enemy encounters stack. If you run from one group, another can show up elsewhere, and both groups can continuously attack you. This isn't what I expected out of a square JRPG. Additionally, the boss fight with my new teammates got me to figure out that the battle system really is just hit it till it dies. The X button is your only attack at this point in the game, and it feels a little repetitive to just mash it. There's a scene where the villains all talk in a dark room, and it's revealed that Hades is in this game, Oogie Boogie as well. Dude, this rocks, right? Right? It, it does rock, doesn't it? Right? My team now has to traverse out of Traverse Town, and goes to the first world on the gummy ship. A ship made out of what I can only assume is gummy candy parts, for a Star Fox-like minigame when you travel between worlds. I'm explaining this all to you now because I don't care about the gummy ship segments. That is the rarest gummy of them all, the gummy Venus de Milo, carved by gummy artisans who work exclusively in the medium of gummy. Will you two stop saying gummy so much? I upgraded my ship design once or twice throughout the entire game and that's it. The stage design is baby easy and not really engaging at all compared to the game's usual action. It did lead me to the first Disney-themed world of the game though, focused around Alice in Wonderland, one of the few Disney classics I saw and enjoyed growing up. Immediately I wondered, however, how exactly do these worlds function? Do the plots of the movies just play in a loop? Why, why is this one in a box? The game really doesn't explain a lot of this. The battle music changes here though, which is good. I was worried that the same battle theme from Traveller's Town would continue playing for every single battle and it was getting on my nerves. The level design really hadn't stumped through. It has some platformer stuff going on, making me wonder if this game is going for a hybrid platformer action RPG thing. But other than that, I felt absolutely lost and I really didn't want to look up a guide to find out what to do. I realized that if playing fully blind was an ordeal, then playing out the official Brady Games strategy guide may soften the needlessly confusing labyrinthine level design I was warned about. If it makes the experience less bad, then whip out the guide for whatever is currently walling you, then toss it back in the closet. I generally avoid guides, but Kingdom Hearts definitely didn't have any satisfying or hot moments that you should worry about spoiling, and definitely had some arbitrary plot triggers. Nothing is testing your intelligence there. Turns out I already did what I needed to do anyway, and had no clue because I didn't really pay attention to the dialogue that said that it didn't matter. As Jiminy Cricket says in the strategy guide, it's worth knowing that it isn't necessary to gather all four pieces of evidence. You can continue the story by gathering just one piece. I'd already collected every piece and had no idea. The rest of the world was pretty easy even if just because I had a guide to fall back on. The boss battle with Mr. Spindly was also fine, but it felt pretty long. Whatever. First world done and over with. Next up was the Hercules world, which has Danny DeVito's character, and that's pretty much all I needed out of this game, even if his voice is mildly different. Move that pedestal over there for me. He told me about the game, and then laughed like the guy from Feel Good Inc. <laughs> Monsters. 
And then Cloud from Final Fantasy VII shows up. Dude, this game genuinely owns sometimes. Like, Danny DeVito and Cloud and Donald Duck in the same room. Like, what, what is even happening? And then I had to fight Cerberus. I don't even know if this is, like, a normal reaction, but I did it over so many times that it felt impossible, and I wanted to give up there and then. I sucked so bad at this fight that I uninstalled the game and didn't want to play any. But then I tried again the next day without recording. I gave up on recording, so I just played it on my TV and realized that by looking through the menus for once, there's a dodge ability and you can assign shortcuts for your magic moves. Stuff I somehow didn't notice by this point, despite there being a text box that tells the player to equip the dodge ability way earlier. Regardless, these newfound skills and assistance from the strategy guide let me beat this giant demon dog with ease. They were really key to doing this. But um, I because the keyblade. I, I fell into darkness, and I couldn't find the light. You'll find it. I'm searching too. For your light. Don't lose sight of it. Up until this point, I had this preconception that every Final Fantasy from 10 onwards played like Kingdom Hearts. I soon found out it was incredibly wrong. Kingdom Hearts is its own thing entirely, the first of its kind for Squire, which gave me additional context while playing. It sort of demotivated me from thinking that this was a game made by master developers crafted for years with a keen eye for good gameplay instead of being one of the first times Square had ever done something like this. Once again, I discussed my confusion in the Goblin Bunker, receiving insight about how exactly Kingdom Hearts compares to other RPGs from people who have played it way more than me. I guess part of my confusion also comes from expecting a Final Fantasy and ending up with the Kingdom Hearts. Expecting a Final Fantasy in what way? Well, like, I knew that combat would be different from Final Fantasy VII or Final Fantasy IV or any pre-Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy games. I don't know how Final Fantasy X does it, by the way, I've never played it. Final Fantasy X is turn-based. This marked a turning point in how I felt about the game, expecting less of a masterful experience, but a unique one nonetheless. I was frightened about what's ahead, that being the Tarzan world, but felt a bit better about the game and its positive aspects. I've never seen Tarzan, though. This marks the first of the movies adapted here that I've never watched. All I know is Phil Collins made music for it, and he- <laughs> Friend, here. Really? Huh? Tarzan swears at me a bunch, the music is good, and the level is kinda badly designed. A quick shooty gun over here refers to the lead party as a circus of clowns. A circus of clowns. But with this line, I was reminded more of the development team. The level design got pretty horrible after needing to go from the camp to the treehouse and then back to the camp again. I was looking up the guide as I was going. Hippo ha! Those animals are so fucking funny, they make me want to merge without looking! I had to stop the big quick shooty gun from shooting the gorillas. And so I saved them from harm. And then I had to fight him once and for all so he wouldn't harm the gorillas. Turns out he was possessed or something. It was kinda lame. This guy's voice acting is the best in the entire game though. Big quick shooty gun is my favorite. What am I doing with these imbeciles? The rest of the world passed the awkward back and forth navigation was a breeze, which is relieving. Despite many stating this as a low point in the game's level design, I was more worried about the enemy encounters, but they were totally okay. It beat another world. This time I got to see another scenes of the villains of the game, and oh, look at their little table. Back to Travis Town once again, and I think the level design reached a new low here. I had to specifically find the entrance to the alleyway, and even with the guide telling me what it was, I had no idea where to actually find it. I went in circles, finding it in the end, but just feeling totally defeated. Also, Kyrie shows up as a hallucination. There's something about this musty place. It reminds me of the secret place back home, where we used to scribble on the walls. Remember? Kyrie? Sora? 
did I mention her earlier? She's Sora's pal. Like, I, I think she went missing or something. I'm noticing a pattern, by the way. Things don't really happen for reasons explained in the story. I don't even know what my goals are, it's just a cycle of and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. Maybe I'm just not engaged in the game enough or something, but this doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> you are. What's going on? Riku! Hey, hey, cut it out. I'm not dreaming this time. Right? I hope not. It took forever to find you. Riku! Wait a second, where's Kairi? Here's where the meat of the game starts. The, the bulk of it. The stuff I was expecting to be good. I'm not really sure if anyone said it, but I just got the idea that Destiny Islands and Wonderland and the Colosseum and Traverse Town and the Jungle were simply a rough beginning to an otherwise fine game. I felt near darn teary seeing that Winnie the Pooh's friends had all gone missing. I'm Sora. Oh, hello Sora. Have you come to say goodbye to Pooh too? Well, no. Why would I do that? We've only just met. Because everyone's gone away. If the other worlds didn't make me feel nostalgic, this one did, if only for the fact that Winnie the Pooh is like quintessential baby material. Stuff that any baby would be familiar with in their earliest years, and something I have vague memories of enjoying in my early years. These characters are anyone's friends, so to see Pooh all alone legitimately made me upset. Other than being sad over this, I was pretty confused over what significance this holds to the gameplay. Even though I checked up on these pals occasionally through my playthrough, I never knew what helping them out would actually get me, or even how to progress in this part. You need to unlock each area, but I don't know what the criteria for unlocking each one is, and I didn't really have much motivation to go out of my way for this, regardless of what I gained from doing so. Let's just ignore it, I guess. Onto Aladdin World, by the way. Another movie I've actually seen. Everyone knows the genie, so I immediately expected that he'd show up here, but first I had to do a bunch of weird level stuff in Agrabah. It's laid out with a lot of verticality, initially not a bad thing until you encounter enemies at high up locations. Basically, if you're on the roof and you're slashing away at a guy, especially one that's floating, you're inevitably gonna fall down. This is one of the issues with having enemy encounters take place in a tightly packed platforming area. Finally, however, the genie shows up. Of course, he's not voiced by Robin Williams, but he is voiced by his direct-to-video counterpart, Dan Castellanato, the same guy who voices Homer Simpson. So, master, what do you have for wish number two? <laughs> How about making me a fabulously wealthy prince? Whoa! This is the first point where I fought to look up the voice cast and found out that Kingdom Hearts absolutely did not hold back on an all-star English voice cast that I assume was brought together solely because Disney is Disney. Sora's English voice actor Haley Joel Osment is known for movies like AI Artificial Intelligence and Forrest Gump, which is not at all something I expected. Like. That kid? The, the robot kid from AI? Like, okay, alright. Also, a little later in this world, Gilbert Gottfried reprises his role as the parrot. Jafar! I've looked everywhere for Jasmine! She's disappeared like magic! Does the parrot have a name? Even if a lot of the voice actors are still just the director video folks, their talent is well represented here and definitely makes the cutscenes enjoyable, accurately replicating the tone and performance of their film counterparts if they're not just the direct same guy anyway. That boy again? He is more persistent than I expected. Why not explain the situation to that boy Riku? Doing so may actually prove useful to our... Wait a second, are you Maleficent? At the end of session 5 I'd started fighting a boss and gave up for the day from burnout. And this time around I'd managed my party a little and got the guy. Into the Cave of Wonders, which is a pretty neat part of the game actually. I got a lot of Ocarina of Time vibes, mainly the Spirit Temple, from how this was designed. If more of the game is like this, then I'd probably start enjoying it more. Finally came the Jafar fight, which is kind of easy compared to the boss fight from outside the cave. 
I really don't get this game sometimes. Onto the next world, except I got swallowed by the whale from Pinocchio, so onto that part instead, I guess. I really don't remember this part too much, but I got a double jump and found the enemy design a little frustrating again. Whatever, I didn't mind it too much. Things were looking up here. I was looking forward to the next set of worlds, if they were all this tolerable, at least. But then, to my horror, I discovered that this next world was the The Little Mermaid one. The The Little Mermaid world is known as this game's worst, being brought up as one of the low points when I discussed the game in the Goblin Bunker, so I didn't really have much hope that this would be very enjoyable at all. I had my guide ready, looked 3D Sebastian in the eyes, and then gave up because I was burnt out again. Around the same time as that previous session, I saw a movie named Welcome Back, Mr. McDonald. One discussed positively in the Action Button Goblin Bunker because a lot of folks there are massive movie freaks and this one kept being mentioned. I was really curious about what it even was, and I liked the idea of just blindly jumping into a movie I knew nothing about, so I did just that. Sounds familiar to my experience with Kingdom Hearts, right? After having seen it on a suspiciously active and not taken down YouTube upload, I found its themes and story resonating with me. I couldn't quite articulate it yet, something about the crew of a radio drama production hectically making changes left and right because of problems that kept coming up was relatable and its message that a creator may never be satisfied with the result of their work cut deep. It's exaggerated here for comedy and such, but I certainly worry that my real, actual experiences, not just with creating but also consuming media, is never satisfying or ideal. I took a step back. Is this how I feel about Kingdom Hearts? That a mess of emotions, a lack of experience, and the stress of doing it all for an experimental project will result in gameplay that doesn't satisfy me. I hadn't played the game in about 20 days. Time for a little journey to the dark world of the heartless. We cannot find the key home. The keyhole is not here. What? The The Little Mermaid World sucks. I needed a guide for the whole thing, the Brady Games guide giving directions, and even then I would get lost because of how confusing a game with no map can be when working with every axis like this. The final fight against Ursula was also a huge pain. You swim around her, avoiding her handful of attacks and striking her at the right time. Her back is the safest place for both avoiding attacks and inflicting attacks. I started noticing around this point that the timing for healing makes it, so if you selected a potion or used the shortcut for cure and get hit within like one second after doing so, you can still get hit and die immediately. It made fast-paced decisions not only here but also later on in the game a massive pain. But this is when I found out Arrow was a useful defensive ability that kinda made it a cakewalk, basically just a shield that minimizes the damage you take. Useful for when bosses just sort of pummel you with attacks. Using this newfound skill, I finally completed the The Little Mermaid world and sighed in relief. Ultimately, the warning of this world being one of Kingdom Hearts' low points really was truthful. I don't think I enjoyed any of it. I was so glad to finally have it over with. I had like eight different headaches during that. Onto the Nightmare Before Christmas world and oh, the Nightmare Before Christmas must have been a massive influence for this game. Think about it, two separate themes contextualized in the story as different worlds clashing together. Christmas is Disney and Halloween is whatever Nomura felt like doing. Kingdom Hearts is founded on this idea that contrasting themes may work when mixed, and both it and Nightmare Before Christmas are commonly found in hot topics, so they've gotta have a lot in common audience-wise. 
I do not like Hot Topic. I did most of the Nightmare Before Christmas world, and then finished due to Burnout. I didn't feel the motivation to keep going, but I wanted to think it was due to how long I played. It was a three hour session. This is the longest up to this point I've played in one go, so perhaps it was fine. I don't know. This world had more of the verticality issue I disliked with Aladdin, requiring you to scale this tower where all kinds of enemies show up along the way, many of them flying in the air. You really need to be careful when fighting these because if you hit them too hard you can just fall back all the way down. It kinda stinks. Also, it's worth noting here that I'm more familiar with the worlds in this game than I'd first thought. Some more than others, but I definitely watched The Little Mermaid, Pinocchio, and Nightmare Before Christmas a lot as a kid, which came as a surprise to me as going in I really thought I'd be confused or indifferent about the Disney representation. And yeah, that's right, my nostalgia was being meddled with here. Years of family home video DVD nights have stuck with me, and now here they are, in my face, clashing with the core Square RPG design. Emotionally this felt pretty weird, but this was definitely the intention behind the premise of Kingdom Hearts. Something about facing the trials of maturity while you're crossing movie friends that that's how you manage the emotional whiplash of growing up. It might be strange, but I think we can all agree that escapism is what you jump to when dealing with difficult feelings, and here this game takes that pretty literally. Sora's friends are growing ever distant from him, and realistically he can't do much about that, so he travels the worlds of these childhood films in an attempt to find an answer. We've all been there, right? You want it? It's yours, my friend, as long as you have enough rubies. Speaking of difficult feelings, I kinda procrastinated big time on playing more of this game. My plan was to beat it by the end of 2022, but in December I sort of neglected to keep going. This could be due to several factors. I had college work due, I was finally finishing the game on Mori because my boyfriend really wanted me to, I was celebrating Christmas with my family, I got even more games to play during Christmas. But none of that necessarily stopped me from playing more Kingdom Hearts. I think this happens with every game I play though, where I'll just get burnt out or something and dread the pressure of needing to play more. It's never because I'm not enjoying it, I don't think, but it definitely prevents me from making progress. Regardless, on the literal first day of 2023, I returned to the game. I defeated Oogie Boogie, another great villain with excellent voice acting, but this fight was ridden with camera issues. I couldn't see what I was doing, at times where I kinda needed to, and even with full camera control I couldn't fully see what was going on because of how it rotates around this big roulette wheel. Even lock-on wouldn't help me here because the guy just kinda runs around the wheel off screen. The only indicators of where he was relative to me were his frequent oh, voice lines. Were this a top-down game, I think the design of the fight would be a lot smoother. The second phase was an enemy rush with yet again the same verticality problems, but I beat the Nightmare Before Christmas world quicker than I'd anticipated. Next up was Peter Pansville, based on a movie I'd never seen before. I'm vaguely familiar with the story of Peter Pan, a, a kid shows up and abducts Londoners to take them to an island inhabited by fairies and other kids, and an evil pirate is there who... Uh, I might not be that familiar with the story, actually. Also, my sister and I have had this dumb in-joke for ages that Tingle from Zelda and Smee from Peter Pan are dating. I genuinely don't know where this came from, but the ship name we came up with was Smingle. Love truly prospers. Oh yeah, for the actual world though, it's more of the same. Enemy after enemy, this time on Hook's ship, meaning that it's all just some corridors and doors. I found it pretty boring and cut this session short without being the world when my friends asked me to go play Fortnite with them. So Wendy's not one of the chosen ones? There are seven, supposedly. And Maleficent says she's not one of them. Hoist anchor as soon as possible. Leave all the dead weight behind, including her. After the trouble of capturing her? And why those seven? What is Maleficent planning anyway? Who knows? My weird hesitation to continue playing continued further throughout January, and I didn't get around to playing more of the game until the 28th. In my notes I cited that this was due to a lack of motivation and that I associate the game with frustration more than anything, but I was finally getting to it. I finally carried on with the game. I completed the rest of the Peter Pan world, ending up more brief than the others. It was pretty much just a fight with Sora's shadow, and then a fight with Captain Hook, and then I got the fly ability and- whoa. 
The final part of this world is in London itself, which is really surreal to me. I've literally been in this area of London multiple times, most recently last August, so to see it here as part of a wacky Final Fantasy Disney RPG is pretty wild even if the reasoning is just that it's where Peter Pan takes place. Look, there I am. But for now, I was anticipating the finale. Three wishes. Yeah, I did the Aladdin world. It sucked. Kingdom Hearts 1 is one of those games I like but has that one part I dread whenever I think of replaying it, except that one part is the entire game. Uh, Crab Claw. I, t I did the Little Mermaid world. It sucked. Finding resources on Destiny Isles is like the single sneeze that heralds the coming flu. I, uh... uh I did the Nightmare Before Christmas world. It sucked. Final Fantasy X is turn-based. Yeah. I did the Peter Pan world, it sucked. Kingdom Hearts definitely didn't have any satisfying or hot moments. I'd heard negative things about the majority of the game, and ended up disliking a lot up to this point, but I'd heard nothing about the rest. I had no clue what to expect, but I knew I was in the final stretch, the big leaks, the climax of this weird, disjointed story where supposedly 90% of the entire plot happens. And I was ready for it, so I just jumped right into it. Immediately, Riku takes Sora's Keyblade, meaning that Goofy and Donald abandon you. The Beast from Beauty and the Beast, another movie I had on DVD, joins your party as he's here on his own behalf to look for Belle. This is a good thing for gameplay though, as no primary weapon means that combat is no longer a focus and the level design makes up for that. I think this works really, really well, and I wish the game had more of these dungeon-y levels rather than the gameplay mostly being enemy encounters that hinder your progress. There are still encounters here, of course, but you rely on the beast to clobber those guys anyway. The music here is also amazing, setting up this grand feeling that things are really getting serious with fancy orchestral melodies. In fact, let's take a moment to talk about the music. I think the soundtrack of this game, by prolific composer Yoko Shimomura, is damn good. Not only is it great as a soundtrack, but all the melodies fit each Disney theme perfectly, and develop on existing theme songs like Under the Sea or the Winnie the Pooh theme with Grace. The original compositions, like for Traverse Town and this current Hollow Bastion area, are lovely too. Traverse Town is super cozy, and as I mentioned, Hollow Bastion is super dramatic. It isn't all ideal, however. During many of the worlds and sequences in the game, I thought the music would get pretty repetitive, regardless of quality. This has more to do with gameplay experience, but I found most of the music catchy in a kinda annoying way. I'm glad each planet has its own music and style, but good Golly gosh darn, it got on my nerves more than a few times. Still, outside of the context of the gameplay, the soundtrack is elegantly brought together and a majority of it is gorgeous. I really wanted to make a note of that here because the Hollow Bastion music is one of my favourite themes in this game and didn't get old the more I played, unlike some of the other worlds in the game. Soon enough, Donald and Goofy rejoin my party and I duel with Riku. Pretty neat stuff. I really wish the game was like this all the time, especially with all the cheesiness. The darkness may destroy my body. But it can't touch my heart. My heart will stay with my friends. It'll never die! Really? Well, we'll just see about that. Ah! Sora ain't gonna go anywhere. You'd betray your king? Not on your life. But I'm not gonna betray Sora either, cause he's become one of my best buddies after all we've been through together. See you later, Donald! Donald and Goofy are my best friends. Next up is the library stuff, and oh, wait. Session 9 was totally lost to the void because a day or two before I had OBS issues and believed messing around with settings might have fixed some things. Turns out I changed the video codec to HEVC, which is totally incompatible with most software and Windows literally charges you to view. I don't know how to fix this, and it also made me realize I don't need to record the rest. It'd be way easier to play the game on my PS4, not hooked up to my capture card at my desk, allowing me to play comfortably in bed instead. Ultimately, this worked out. I felt the stress of recording at a desk lingering the entire playthrough up till now. The footage that you've seen on screen for session 9 has been someone else's playthrough. <laughs> And session 10 wasn't recorded at all. Session 10 was also the longest, totaling at about 6 hours. I'll explain why. There's someone here to see you, by the way. Try not to be... cringe. In front of your best friend. Hey Sora, or should I say, Gaylord. I roll with a different crowd now. Wanna see me smoke? 
Oh god damn it, Riku. I wanted to beat the game. I knew the finale was coming up. The session began with both phases of the Maleficent boss fight, which I thought was the penultimate boss of the whole game until I realized at a certain point I was wrong. That point is when I beat Riku afterwards. A fight which I thought was pretty good compared to basically any other boss fight, and then the game just continued. It was already past midnight. I enjoyed the segment where you play as a little guy dude heartless fella thinking it was part of the major big finale sequence, when suddenly the story just sent me back to Traverse Town, explaining that I need to then go back to Hollow Bastion again through an arduous go ask Sid to install the gummy for him to tell you to go get the gummy so that you can return and ask him to install it segment. This frightened me. I didn't know how much more of the game there would be. I thought Hollow Bastion was the end, but now that this is happening, I was running out of patience, but I kept going because I was certain I could do it. 1am. The next fight was with the Behemoth, which kinda sucked. This is where I really felt underpowered, not because of the difficulty of the fight, but because of how much HP this thing has, taking about 5 solid minutes to defeat. It's fine though, I got it beaten with ease, and the game told me that I'm at the end of the world, and boy let me tell you I had enough already. But this is the final stage, right? 2 AM. I was gonna get through it. This is it, the end part, except this end part sucks. It's just a big corridor of enemy encounters, and two of those I stumbled into were literally just the behemoth again, unchanged, still long and tedious. This is excruciating. but. Okay, maybe it was horrible, but I got to the next part, which is a rush of enemy encounters again. The scenery is different, but it's just more fights with no engaging level design. This felt so monotonous, I was more than tired, but I was getting through it just fine. 3 AM. The next boss is the guy from Fantasia. Fantasia is pretty good. I have some strong memories of the first and only time I saw it. It's definitely the most unique Disney classic for how much it's kind of just a bunch of animators doing what they want along to music. And this big demon guy is one of the scenes I remember. If I recall, it's at the end and really feels like it for being such a major moment of drama and fright. This boss battle was also a major moment of drama and fright, but not for any story reasons. In fact, the guy pretty much appears out of nowhere and no dialogue is said, but the fight felt like a huge smack in the face for that. No story relevance, no dialogue, it's just another Disney thing. This obviously isn't the final boss, but it's the hardest one so far, and for what? I tried fighting him, it was a huge pain. You fly around him, avoiding his handful of attacks and striking her at the right time. His back is the safest place for both avoiding attacks and inflicting attacks. Yes. It's essentially the Ursula fight again. One of the fights I disliked the most, now scaled up for the climax of the game's difficulty, with an impenetrably huge health bar and dealing damage like a casino dealer deals cards. God, what a dumb line. Why did I write that? It is rough. And normally the spike in difficulty would be fine justified since this is the end of the game, but at this point all I wondered is if I had to grind more. I was at level 45 or 46, something like that, thinking I'd battled enough battles up until Chernobog showed his face and threw me into a circle of hell. Whatever the case, I didn't have time or patience to defeat this guy. I didn't want to go back and grind just for a fighting chance. I didn't want to try over and over until I developed godlike video game learning skills. I didn't even really want to play more of Kingdom Hearts. I really wholeheartedly had enough. I quit. I've just about had it with the end of the world level. So yeah, fuck this game and that level. I have been stuck on this fight for a long ass time. As a kid growing up, I loved KH1, but due to my experience, I never beat the game. Now, I'm playing the final mix and I still can't beat the game. I'm at the end of the world, 
I hope this is the last level, because I'm about to throw this disc out of the window. I'm stuck at the big black demon asshole with wings. I literally cannot beat him. He's fucking impossible to beat, because I can literally only get 3 to 5 hits on him before A. He AOEs with his stupid fire shield, or B, he pushes us back. Goofy and Donald don't do shit, since they keep getting killed 100% of the time and waste all my potions. I worried I won't have enough potions for the final boss fight. I love the KH for what is is, and the lore. But my god, do I hate the gameplay on Kingdom Hearts 1. I've never loved and hated a game so much in my entire life. So yeah, I wasn't kidding. I actually gave up on the game. I reached my conclusion on what I thought about the gameplay, and I really, really didn't want more of it. And yeah, this doesn't mean I think it's bad. Here's the thing I don't really understand about critiquing games. How do you define an entire multi-dozen hour experience positively or negatively? I see discourse and discussion over the quality of video games all the time, to a point where I have no idea about my own tastes. That's what inspired me to start this whole project. Kingdom Hearts is silly, but popular and generally considered a hardcore Nomura project spanning a large-scale story everyone is universally confused about. And I, a huge fan of video games as a medium, am a blank slate. I don't have any standards, finding something enjoyable in even the lowest quality games I've played. I wanted to make this project about Kingdom Hearts because it's something I knew utterly nothing about. Yeah, talking about the funny wacky RPG series as a total newcomer is something that can be comedic, but at the root of this project is my unbeatable curiosity about games I may never play otherwise. Kingdom Hearts is a game I never had much reason to be into. Its lack of presence during my childhood and its lack of accessibility over the years being major factors. I just inexplicably managed to avoid interacting with Kingdom Hearts, anything related to Kingdom Hearts. Of watching videos about it, seeing discussion about it online, nothing was spoiled for me past the first few hours I'd seen on Vox Galsoy's stream. Yeah, you know, boys, it's it's Disney Ducks. <laughs> Fucking controller keeps popping on the floor, damn it! I left myself entirely to my own devices to form my own opinion, but look, I don't even know how to form my own opinions. When I play a game and dislike it, I'll just assume I need to improve at it or it's just too hard for me. If I do like a game, I usually have some pre-established fondness, like with the Little Big Planet series I grew up playing or ever accessible Nintendo games. Never do I think much about my actual standards or tastes, just sort of accepting that basically any video game can be fun with the right perspective. So playing Kingdom Hearts was going to test this ambiguity, a genre I don't have much experience with, a franchise I know nearly nothing about, you get it. This meant that consistently, through the game's many challenges, I wondered how skilled I actually was, if I was doing it right, or if the game just wasn't fun. Getting this far? Reaching what I presume is the penultimate battle of the entire game wasn't easy for me. That's why I felt insulted by its persistence to just keep going past what I thought would be the end. Because it meant I had to struggle more and more. I, I, I think I suck at this game. I couldn't get a handle on its controls, I couldn't tolerate losing, I had to stop each session around two hours because of fatigue. Kingdom Hearts consistently was not fun for me. The reason I gave up and quit was because I genuinely disliked the gameplay, and I didn't want to endure however more there was, even if I was close to beating it. Kingdom Hearts falsely feels like a fun game, or a comforting game, or an easy game, because of anything other than the gameplay, I, it, like, I love the visuals, the art, the environments, the music, the commitments of painstakingly recreating each Disney film, with real-time PS2-era graphics, its weird original plot, its UI design, pretty much anything about this game that isn't the game part of the game. I do not know if I like Kingdom Hearts.
Now, at this point Square has been making role-playing games for a long time. Were there many people in your organization who had experience of making a game as action-oriented as this? No, there was hardly anyone. I get the feeling that the process of taking your original vision and turning it into a satisfactory finished article was far from straightforward. Am I right? From the very start of the project, when I assembled the team, we realized that there were lots of staffs who'd never worked on an action game. So naturally, yes, there were some dark moments. Squaresoft didn't know what the hell they were doing. When making this game, they were pushing to be known as a CG animation studio as well as a game dev company. They put CGI in each of their big boy PS1 games, continuing this trend with Final Fantasy X and then Kingdom Hearts, as well as their first feature-length movie, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. It was a very specific moment in time where the advent of CGI in the mainstream and the ever-growing demand for big beautiful polygonal graphics into the PS2 era was the way to go for Square. Working with a company like Disney also definitely meant a huge amount of resources were dedicated to accurately converting these historically renowned movies into 3D for the first time. But this was all with Nomura's fresh idea for gameplay resulting in an entirely new type of game, something beyond Square's established capabilities. I did not know, when playing Kingdom Hearts for the first time, that this was Square's first 3D action RPG, and its development struggled due to that. But it does explain a lot of the issues I found with my experience, and in hindsight I can see what went wrong. At the time, this didn't seem to bother critics too much. The main complaint was about camera controls. Every review I found complained about the camera controls, which they fixed in the remaster that I played, but otherwise their reviews were largely positive. Its departure from the turn-based RPG style was actually met with praise, being one of the earliest 3D RPGs to let you battle in real time and really feel like you are Sora. GamePro described it as reminiscent of old N64 Zelda games, which is weird because Ocarina of Time was like four years before and Majora's Mask was even more recent, but okay. And that action RPGs and Square games don't get much better than this. The official play PlayStation magazine in the US explained that it's worth playing despite all the Disney, with the UK equivalent praising its production value and scolding its repetition. World-renowned <laughs> world renowned critic Tommy Tallarico said it sucked and there should be more voice acting, and as for everybody's favourite, Riku Lover 9, they really loved the characters and story. It's one of their favourite games. It's amazing. But I can't exactly agree or relate with these reviews. They're all from two decades ago. PlayStation magazine writers got paid to write that stuff. I, I, I didn't even play the same version of the game, and Tommy Tallarico is a dumbass. Tommy, how many games world records do you have? Um, that's- so I have seven. So, there's some perspective differences here, but this still doesn't feel right to me. Also, I just have to note that during my research for this video, Tony Tellerico was unavoidable. I, I, I don't even know how this happened. His electric playground E3 specials were the bulk of what footage covering E3 2001-2002 I could find, and when searching through PS2 magazine demo discs, I accidentally checked demo disc 62 instead of disc 61, which had Kingdom Hearts coverage, and up front and center on disc 62 is a Tommy Tallarico house tour for some reason. Action gameplay has vastly developed over time, and even Kingdom Hearts as a series has definitely improved. I didn't read up on any new reviews, and I haven't played any of the sequels yet, but it's wild to me that such a seemingly flawed experience gained such praise at the time. It's not even exclusively a matter of opinion. The developers were inexperienced in this relatively new genre of gameplay, and I did have a hard time with the game due to design decisions I found unconventional and confusing. This is the conclusion I reached, that it's just an imperfect game. I know that Kingdom Hearts is a highly customizable gameplay experience, however. Maybe it isn't clear in all the ways that it is, and I definitely didn't utilize its systems to their potential, but it has me wondering what would happen if I replayed it, or if it's even worth replaying. I cannot deny, though, that Kingdom Hearts has been a special experience unlike anything else I've played. For better or worse. I came in not sure what to expect, and 
came out not sure what to highlight. While noting my thoughts session by session and editing the very video you're watching, I reconsidered the structure of the game. It's filled with moments that just sort of happen. One thing, then the next, then the next. I thought this was an issue with my writing and I could have done better, but the game just sort of plays like this. As a player, you're not given much context for the story, things just sort of happen, and even the main characters don't really know what's going on. It's surreal, dare I say it feels rushed and cobbled together, but the story of the game is my favourite part nonetheless. Why is that? Over the course of working on this whole video project, I've been trying to solve the mystery of Kingdom Hearts. My original impressions were scathingly negative, and the first draft of this segment involved dunking on the game, comparing it to Mario 64, and coming to a vague, uncertain conclusion. But I was fixated. The editing process has kicked my ass way more than the game ever did, and revisiting the footage had me reconsider it all. I made the choice of picking the mystic trait and dropping the shield trait. I don't know how or if these questions affected gameplay at all, so I just went with my honest answers. I want friendship. I want to see rare sights. I'm afraid of being indecisive. Oh, you're gonna be fucking kidding me. My XP for each level remained consistent throughout the whole game. My base strength was 5. My base defense was 1. I had 3 magic points and 3 ability points. In other words, sacrificing the shield meant worse defense, and choosing the staff meant more magic points. And like, the magic in this game blows. I relied on it so much when I really shouldn't have, all because it was my strongest trait from the start, but it's probably my least favourite part of combat. What I should have done was pick the strength and drop the magic, but I made the mistake of picking magic and dropping the defence. I found that this basically puts the game on hard mode. I replayed the game, not just on my PS4 again, no, but on my Nintendo Switch. Remember that gross cloud streaming version I mentioned earlier? Yeah, I bought it. I replayed the game on my Switch, and I had a blast, I picked strength, I dropped magic, and it made the game really easy. All the problems I did have, at least with combat, had vanished. All of a sudden, I was having fun. You wouldn't think it being a cloud-streamed, internet-based port, but that fact rarely caused me any actual gameplay issues. Like. As dumb as it sounds, I prefer this version. I might have an affinity for handheld devices over consoles, but that's something I can explore some other time. What's important now is that I finally get this game. I'm finally satisfied. It isn't perfect, but it rocks. However, I still had yet to solve its biggest mystery. Why is it like that? Why does every cutscene have this awkward atmosphere about it? Why does the game move along like a list of tasks? Why is the story so disjointed? Why does it start like that? And more importantly, how does it end? I may never know the answers to most of these questions, but I can make an informed guess about the story, especially if I see the ending. And yeah, I saw the ending because I replayed the game. You spend the entire game trying to find your friends. Reaching Hollow Bastion, you save Kairi, but Riku still needs to be saved from turning evil under the influence of Ansem, the villain who gets introduced literally right in the final few hours of the game. Your task is to rescue him, and upon defeating Ansem, you do. But there's a small twist here. Riku is Sora's best friend, his pal, his buddy, his boyfriend probably, but they don't reunite. With the ending of the game, Riku is sealed away. Whatever Sora does, they're still separated. 
I separated from Kyrie too, but like who even cares? The ending isn't idealistic. It isn't happy. It's melancholic and subverts what joyful Disney fairy tales would lead you to think about. Sora's friends are safe, I guess, but he doesn't get to be with them forever. He moves on, and holy shit. I think the message of this whole story is of a struggle with leaving things behind. Let's say for a moment that his parents are real. This one shot of his bedroom in his house that's never brought up ever again is the only shot of the real world in this story. Destiny Islands is the embodiment of Sora's vision of his life with friends. It's this tropical paradise where he just gets to play and hang out all day with his pals and also Titus from Final Fantasy, I guess. This is all ripped away from him one fateful night, represented by a huge storm of darkness, and to cope with that, he seeks an escape. I brought up earlier about the trials of maturity and escaping it as a coping mechanism. I believe that's what this is. Instead of dealing with the reality of this situation, Sora immerses himself in childhood memories, reminiscing over Disney movies he grew up on rather than facing the harsh truth of abandoning his adolescence. He sees reality as the darkness, as the enemy that steals his best friend away from him. That's just how he reacts, and the conclusion of this journey is not to reunite with him, but to accept their separation from whatever real change is causing this, without abandoning the memories that make them who they are. And not to go into any details, of course. I find this interpretation relatable. I've found myself reminiscing and being overly sentimental about the media I grew up on as a way to temporarily escape from all kinds of real troubles. When interpreted this way, Kingdom Hearts is a story about the real nostalgia its developers had for the Disney films they were able to work with. They saw the potential to tell a story about this sentimentality, and based an entire RPG around it. Reading it in this way has gotten me to realize that, in a lot of ways, Kingdom Hearts is the most relatable game I've played. It's so odd from the outside, but deep within its soul is this emotional coming-of-age journey about letting your friends go. In the time I've worked on this project, I watched a load of Disney movies. I revisited the ones that meant the most to me, and some that I found more relevant to Kingdom Hearts, like Fantasia. I told myself it was for this project, but over time I began to notice that I just wanted to watch these movies I grew up on again. I found myself reminiscing, in the same way Sora does, amidst the stress of many real things I'm currently going through. Nothing bad, by the way, just a lot of changes, so I'll, you know, I'll, be, I'll be fine. And I had a nice time doing so. Like, wow, when I watched the Muppet movie again, I fucking cried, man. Like, that doesn't happen often with anything. Toy Story nearly brought me to see this too. Fucking Toy Story nearly made me cry. Like, that, like I, I, that doesn't happen. I found myself appreciating some of this animation, sure, but I also felt nostalgic in a melancholy sort of way. Disney, as a corporation that is hell-bent on getting people to watch their movies has been trying to chase this feeling for years, by the way. Remakes are the result of that emotional chase, I guess, but Disney's live-action remakes all suck. I don't think they realized that they struck the perfect emotional chord 20 years ago with Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts is now available for PlayStation 2. Nice! Give me the cheat codes. Uh, oh no! Someone's coming! Uh, I'm out of here! Hey! Uh, hey! That's it for now. I'm shutting down. Um... It is currently, it's like 2 a.m. I've been editing this. I just got done editing it. Um, I've never done a project like this before. So, if, I mean, if it was enough for you to stick till the end, then I really appreciate that you did. I really, I wanted to mention a couple of things that I didn't really get to mention in the video that I noticed. Uh, while I was, like, 
like in in the past like week or so of making it and like finalizing it i was like oh wait a minute that probably would have been like a cool thing um i mentioned that i watched the muppet movie and that got me to realize or that got me to want to like go and listen to a bunch of the carpenters because uh i, I, I I'm not, I'm not really sure on the details, but it's like Paul Paul Williams who like wrote the music in the Muppet movie was also like a major songwriter for the Carpenters and uh, the like obviously the Rainbow Connection and such. Uh, and so I went back and the Carpenters kind of like resonated a lot with the way that I felt about Kingdom Hearts in ways that I don't really know how to describe very easily. Um, it was like, because I, I guess I grew up listening to them, uh, in some ways. Like sometimes, like occasionally, uh, it's one of those things I just remember. And I would like feel like very emotional listening to it because it was like, it's like, I, like as a kid, it's like you don't get exposed to many things that make you feel like truly like emo emotions. Uh, and the Carpenters is one of the earliest it, it, things that I remember listening to. That I was like, whoa! Like this really strikes a chord with me. And re-listening to a lot of it. Um, I actually don't know, or like I didn't know a lot of their songs, uh, I've, I've just been like listening to like every album and it's like most of the music is like absolutely like I've never heard it before, but there's a few songs that stick out as like tracks that I definitely remember and kind of feel like majorly, like hugely, I don't know if nostalgic is the right word, but just whatever, like, whatever happened with Kingdom Hearts, the way that I interpret uh, Sora's, like, mentality during the game, the way, like, the way that he views the world, um, and the way that he, like, it, it escapes with these Disney movies, kind of, it, like, th there's one song in particular by the Carpenters that it's basically about that, or at least in, like, the sense of, like, revisiting a thing that you really liked a lot. Um, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get the song up, because I, I don't remember the name of it. Um, but I just remember, I, I, I remember hearing the lyrics and just being like, whoa, like, that's creepy. Like, that's really creepy. Um, the song is, okay, it's Yesterday Once More. Uh... I, 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 it's not it's not playing but uh it, uh, like it's not playing for you you can't you can't hear the audio uh for copyright reasons but uh let me just i mean let me look through the the lyrics right um it's something it's something like uh when i was young i'd listen to the radio waiting for my favorite songs when they played i'd sing along it made me smile those were such happy times and not so long ago how i wondered where they'd gone but they're back again, just like a long-lost friend. All the songs I loved so well. Uh, wow, Spotify isn't letting me scroll down. Uh, that's cool. Um, yeah, it's like, I, it's it's like I don't know. Like I I would I would just listen to it. Um, but I think it sums up the way that I feel about. Kingdom Hearts better than like I could actually like say in this video and I just thought that it would like it's, it's very much worth mentioning here I was considering like putting it as like like the music that plays at the end of the video but obviously that would have like massive like DMCA copyright issues so I didn't do that but wow um it, it's kind of uncanny it's really like it really matches very well, and it's also creepy because this song, it, like, this specific song is one of the Carpenter's songs that I remember hearing, like, when I was little. 
So when I heard it, I was having a moment that they describe in the song, and I was like, oh, like, ooh. Um, but yeah, it's it's a little freaky. I still, I still haven't played uh, any of the other Kingdom Hearts games. Uh, I've just played the first one. So I'm hoping that if I if I play Kingdom Hearts 2 or like the GBA game or whatever, uh, that it doesn't like spoil this this sort of understanding that I've had about Kingdom Hearts 1 about it like as a game on its own. Uh, because from what I understand there's like heavy detailed lore. And I think at that point it escapes being like this kid's fantasy to just like actually being this like real life thing that's going on. Like this actual, like I don't know. It seems a bit messy. Um But uh, yeah. uh um uh thank you. <laughs>